I was on holiday with um, my husband discussing an idea for a novel that I was writing um, and he suggested that it should be about a world whereby killer robots were real um, but they only didn't kill black people He's like, because they wouldn't recognise black people as being human. And I was like, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> Right now, humans are the only intelligent beings on the planet. And that means that we have to do a lot of work, because essentially all intelligent actions require a human to be involved with it. But we want to have free time. We want to be able to get intelligence on tap. The role of AI in our society is uh, to do the things that we don't want to do, to do the things that we find difficult or tedious, or the things that are dangerous. I want to see robots built that can drive cars more safely than people can. And that's imminent. That's something which is going to happen at some point in the next couple of decades. Machines that can diagnose uh, heart conditions or tumors with greater reliability than human experts can. And when that technology finally fully works, it will save a million lives a year. I mean, that's for me, that's the excitement of, of, of what AI can do. We need to be careful um, not to try to delegate too much humanity to machines. I think the empathy and the kindness really should lie with the people. That's what people are for. It's us that should be empathetic and kind. If we see AI as an enormous, gigantic, growing, powerful reservoir of agency, the ability to solve problems, without an intelligence but under the guidance of individuals who have a clear sense of what needs to be solved, how, why, at what time, for whom, well then the role of these huge muscles in our society could be extremely positive or negative. It will be up to us to direct this enormous amount of, shall we say, energy uh, to solve the right problems. For me, what, what motivates and excites me is going back to a how does the technology that we create change how we think and how we perceive? Where design and art is important in the context of science and technology is really, you know, ha understanding how do you create that dialogue where uh, technology is enhancing our perception, our cognition to, to be able to see more, understand more and discover more. Rather than allowing it to copy the world, which it really wants to do actually, the default AI parameters means it just wants to reflect what is there. And like that for me isn't necessarily good enough because you're still picking up the biases that exist in society. The critical aspect is really that we have to see this technology in conjunction to our own critical thinking. My feeling though is that AI can be used to augment, not replace human judgment. It can be another voice in the room, but I would be nervous about it being more than another voice in the room. The truth of the world is uh, aggregation of biases, fundamentally. And any anthropologist or sociologist worth their salt knows that in many ways you are describing the unique proclivities and inclinations of any culture when you're doing any research. Fundamentally, we are building our models to recognize these because there is no unbiased model in the world, but there is a recognition of what stories of the culture we're feeding into a model. And this is the problem when you want to teach um, machines, because if we just give them explicit rules, they are going to miss out on a lot of common sense. And it's important because common sense is what tells us that if I'm designing a car, it should be possible to leave the car. That's not something anybody explicitly have to tell a car designer. But if you have a machine designing the car, that would be very useful. But we have this idea that often if a machine does it, there is some kind of rational reason and that um, always is better than anything else. The thing about machine learning, which is one of the cornerstones of current artificial intelligence, is that it's all based on taking data of uh, past experiences, and then you train the machine to do the right thing based on this data. We have reality, 
and we have aspiration, we can only teach it on reality. We cannot teach it on what doesn't exist. What we can do is we can watch it fail constantly and then use that failure as a point of optimization. Human biases quite often infiltrate our data. If you take language data from society, just what people post on the internet and what's written in newspapers, that contains subtle biases about genders, because uh, men and women are mentioned in different contexts, which reflect differences in society and how our culture views them. If you feed that into an AI system, it's going to learn the pattern. It doesn't truly understand it, but it just repeats it. So the problem might be that this software, acting out of pure statistics, now embodies various gender biases. In our case, uh, when we are assessing the credit risk of a company, one data that we had was uh, the gender of um, the directors, for instance. We could say, OK, I have this data. Should I take it into account uh, in my model? So at first, we, we tested and we found that it was actually not relevant. It was not statistically relevant. Now you have more and more people who use AI models. In a few weeks, you can go online and uh, start to be a junior data scientist. And if you are not critical about your models or if your data are bad, you might end up with a model who would actually give weight to the gender. Everything with the, um, the development of uh, AI, I think uh, people need to think about, uh, think a lot about it. Uh, you, you need uh, ethics uh, and you need uh, regulatory bodies, otherwise it's going to be uh, the Wild West. We've done this before, we've been here before. Technologies, they often have an initial moment of trial and error, see what happens, can we do this, can we do that, and then slowly, I hope this time not too slowly, uh, we come and uh, uh, as a society, uh, the we of we the people, and we regulate uh, to make sure that things are properly done and uh, all the major risks are either avoided, mitigated, or they don't arise in the first place. I think the important thing is for the relevant, for the relevant professional organisations and groups that set professional standards to look at how AI is and might be used within their professions and to make a judgment on what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable. In the area of, of healthcare, there are signs that, that this is happening already. There was one interesting example where a system was trying to diagnose whether people with pneumonia could stay at home or needed to be brought to the hospital. And it was misdiagnosing people with asthma and pneumonia as being totally safe and they could stay at home. The reason was, of course, that the survival rate of having asthma and pneumonia in its training data was really high because all doctors know that asthma and pneumonia is bad news. You must go to the hospital and get a lot of treatment. And since they always went to the hospital and got a good treatment, they survived really well. Now, in this case, since they, when they viewed what was going on inside the system, they could say, OK, that's really bad. We need to fix this. With respect to issues like predictive policing, um, there is a danger that the technology runs ahead of the regulators and starts to be used before people have really thought deeply about how it might be used responsibly and safely. We decided to do a, a project on the use of live facial recognition because the Metropolitan Police were trialling it in London. Facial recognition is decision support mechanism. It's, it's to help decision making on the ground, which means that if the machine tells you this person looks like a person on the database, the officer still has the responsibility to ask themselves, is this person the person that I'm looking for? The other sort of main area in which the police have been you know, developing their use of artificial intelligence or you know, um, algorithms is in the area of predictive policing. Kent Police Service was, was trialling something called PredPol, which is a programme developed in the States. Um, they used it for a few years and then decided not to continue with its use. Um, and the reasons for that were that they found, broadly speaking, that their human analysts were just as good at predicting the likely crime hotspots. 
but also that their police officers didn't necessarily follow um, the lead of their of the findings of predictive policing. Now the difficulty is if you have um, um, officers who are biased towards action, they may well just do what the machine tells them. Equally, if they are using their discretion, there's further scope for bias because it may be that they do what the machine tells them in some circumstances and not others. And then there's a question about, well, in what circumstances do they follow the machine's instructions? Is it when they see a young black man walking down the, the street that they're more likely then to not question an identification? One of the experiments which has, or, or trials which has been done um, in the UK was by the Durham Constabulary who were using a predictive alg algorithm to risk assess people who were in custody. Those algorithms need to be transparent. We, we need to be able to see where an algorithm has come from, what's in it, what the data points are. It needs to be intelligible to us. We need to understand it, not just see it, we need to understand it. There needs to be accountability, there needs to be a form of audit so that we know when algorithms are being used and what their impact is. Many decisions we make, we say, that's a gut feeling, my intuition tells me this. And we're kind of proud of that. And when we say it's a very bad thing that machines are black boxes and cannot tell us the reasons, but we say the bank executive who did the right thing because he felt it in his gut that that was the right thing. Oh, he's very experienced. Because in humans, of course, that experience turns into this knowledge about the world, which is implicit and hidden and as inaccessible as the neural networks in the machines. It's just that we tend to trust humans a little bit more, partially because we can hold them responsible. The black box, well, if it acts badly, it doesn't know that and it doesn't care. The bank executive is at least going to be a bit embarrassed if he loses a few billions. Using predictive methods to assess people's likelihood of future behaviour does raise ethical questions which I think are quite serious about how far you're justified in treating people in the present on the basis of what they might do in future. We're not remotely at a stage yet when we know how to be able to reliably build systems that are going to make such sensitive decisions. Algorithms have the scope to be unfair in many, many areas. You know, if you're choosing employment, your employees through algorithm, that can be incredibly unfair. The big difference in policing is that the kind of powers that the police have means you have to be really, really careful to get it right. Society has been institutionally racist basically for as long as we can go back. And if we were to wait in each space for society to correct itself before we corrected different kind of professional or cultural areas, then nothing would ever happen. Technology is used for control, surveillance, uh, to sell us things, and eventually it will be used to automate jobs as well, and this change is happening really quickly. The fascinating thing is, of course, that even defining a bias is tricky. For a long time, people didn't think that uh, the sexism was a thing. It was just the way the world worked. So people complaining about different treatment uh, of men and women were regarded as slightly odd. Gradually, people realized they actually had good arguments, and gradually it was seen as a big problem. The really optimistic possibility might be that we can use machine learning to detect biases. And that's kind of how I treat working with an AI. So as opposed to kind of thinking of it something that embeds and copies the world and reproduces the categories that are already there, what I try to do is think of the AI as kind of a defacting element. So you put your data set in and rather than trying to just get it to copy the data set in one way or the other and therefore the categories and the biases that are already in the data set, you kind of create new forms from this. How lots of public spaces are designed will be using kind of AI systems. Right now, inevitably, the people who are making that kind of work are white men. We talk about efficiencies, we talk about economic growth, sustainability, but we should also remember that people come into urban environments 
with a notion that they really believe in combined human effort. You believe in this momentum that comes from the concentration of a population. And yet, all these cities become more and more segmented, create more and more isolation. So why not explore dynamic systems physically that would allow for more interaction, that allow for the sense of presence and belonging? If we think about knife crime, you'll hear police officers in London say we can't police our way out of knife crime, that we need to use different approaches, that we need to use a public health approach. So rather than arrest young people who are carrying knives, we ought to create an environment in which they don't feel they need to. The smart city also needs to be possible to change and reprogram by the people. It's a bit like an open society. Open societies allow anybody to point out that something is wrong. And if enough other people think that, yes, this is indeed a problem, then you can fix it. They can always be changed. The fact that the data is brought in from a very narrow group of people. There is a cultural uh, bedrock to meaning and you have to build those in into any systems that you design. If you wanted to build a model to recognize grime, for example, and you did it without taking the people into account, you would probably get a bunch of tracksuits and Stormzy videos. But if you get the data from the culture itself, not from me or you, and see what sort of imagery locals associate with grime, what sort of clothing the locals themselves associate with grime, what kind of, and by locals I mean the practitioners in that, in that subculture, and use that as a training set. So it's really a ground up training set of information. Then fundamentally you've created a, a grime model that is designed by the people for the people. And are the people biased? Maybe they are, but you cannot replace the people. <laughs> I'm using this deep fake technology that's been talked about quite a lot. And usually deep fakes are used either for like comedy memes or a lot for sort of shaming women. So I was taking this technology and trying to think about like how you could use it to reimagine narratives and reimagine histories and proposing how it could create these new forms from it. We want to build out a system that uh, fundamentally allows you to open a computer, type in anything, a question about humanity, a question about history, a question about psychoanalysis, and using the tremendous machine learning models that are existing or coming into existence, be able to be served up an empathetic and insightful answer that you can actually use. Presently, information has been indexed, but people and culture has not been indexed. And only a machine can do that. Where you can have the access to not only books, but also the insights from books and the understanding from books and reports and journals and movies and videos and people at your fingertips. I think the press has essentially two responsibilities here, satisfaction and simplification. It tends to simplify too much uh, in a patronizing way. The number of times I've been told that the message has to be simpler because they will not get it. Are you sure? I'm not quite sure. People are expecting difficult things because there are difficult times. And the other thing is um, uh, an excessive amount of, uh, I call it satisfaction, targeting of every single need, giving people what they expect, what they want. Uh, in a way, it's almost like semantic pornography. Uh, you really tickle and satisfy the, the, the worst, essentially, interest that we all have, uh, the gossip, the, the, the extraordinary claim, when in fact, the real business happens uh, with the, the boring, the difficult, the, the hard stuff. They are sort of amplifying the distance between people and technology more and more in order to scare them. It's really, I think, it's on their hands to educate them. And there have been so many movements of education um, amongst uh, the cultural and journalist uh, class, whether it is on uh, LGBTQ rights, women's rights, animal activism, environmentalism, etc. We have, as a species in society, been able to teach complex ideas to people who don't know them as we move forward. Uh, and, 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 and with machines and AI, we've, we've done the opposite, where we have uh, scared people that they're going to be locked up for being black, 
which is really a very, very frightening scenario. Ninety-nine percent of the world is running and actually progressing and being quite powerful because of this, and those stories don't come up. So, I think the fault lies in us more than anything else because it's easier to do that. Uh, it's much more boring to say that essentially it's an optimization system that's making things more smooth. Another thing that I think is important is kind of dismantling some of the myths around artificial intelligence in the sense that like the big tech companies call it artificial intelligence and that sort of has a certain uh, connotations around it. I'm used to thinking of it in terms of statistics and correlations and if you called this whole area creative statistics or whatever, people wouldn't think, get so sort of worked up about deferring all the sort of responsibility to the AI. Every society has an implicit, maybe silent, maybe not immediately visible, but very present human project in mind. It develops along lines of that's where I would like to be if I could. Now this human project is something that can either be simply inherited from the past, uh, passively uh, absorbed like a legacy, or it can be a more conscious, uh, more explicit effort, thinking in terms of, but what society do we want to live in? What kind of uh, ideal world we would like to step towards? Now, when I normally ask this question to politicians, uh, I ask them in a difficult way, say, imagine you don't have any crisis, you don't have any problem, inflation is okay, uh, employment is okay, there is no war, there is no terror. Imagine for a moment that everything is doing okay. What's your project? And they have no words. It's not a one-stage thing where this is going to be created, we're all going to get around the table and it's going to be created and we're all going to decide together how it's going to be the social engineer worker with the scientist, the AI scientist, with the designer, with the artist. It's about within uh, how the models and the systems which we implement it and the process, we create opportunities at every stage for this to be opened up, um, criticized, understood, and seen as a tool uh, rather than as an autonomous construct. Um, and understood from all these different perspectives as is this tool working in the way to enhance our capability. To me, the, the 21st century should have, as a human project, globally speaking, the special marriage between the green and the blue. The, the green of our world, uh, of our uh, environment, uh, but also of our economy, sharing, circular economy, and the blue of the technologies, AI, uh, Internet of Things, uh, the digital uh, technology that we have everywhere. If we were to get that marriage right, then there would be something we could really be proud of. Future generations could look back and say, they had a project, it was a good project, and thank you for realizing that project. We owe you. <laughs>